welcome to the D3D4 Football Podcast with me, your host, James Richards. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, our first real podcast of 2020-21, and it's our annual catch-up with Mr. James McKeown. And James, am I getting your name right here? I know I call you Macca, but is it McKeown or McEwen? It's McEwen, but I wouldn't have corrected oh, you if you dear, hadn't asked. You've been too kind to me all these years. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I've been called a lot, lot worse. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty used to, to be fair. I don't know if my granddad was drunk or whatever, but it's, it's a bad pronunciation of the spelling, but he's, he's meant to be McEwen, so I'm told, so. Oh, I see, I see. Well, I apologize. I've been calling you the completely wrong name for like five years now, whatever it's been, but actually. <laughs> But uh, we we've, we sort of had a chat off air, but it, a lot has changed since I last spoke to you, hasn't it? It's an absolutely surreal situation, not just football, but the world has found itself in. Something that probably if we someone had mentioned this to us a year ago, we'd have thought, yeah, mate, you've you've had one too many to drink. No, that like it's bizarre. It's absolutely bizarre. But like you say, I think it's bizarre for everyone. You know. Whether you're a teacher and you've been doing half classrooms, whether you're a footballer, I don't think no matter what you are, anyone could have obviously preempted the impact it's had on your day to day life, your work life. Um, and to be like, you know, I know we spoke about it off air, but like as a family, we really enjoyed like a long spell of it. And then there's other spells like where you go for a day out and like your kids are having to wear a mask. Um, yeah. Yeah, strange, isn't it? Theme parks and it's it's bizarre, really. Bumping. I had a photo of someone in a supermarket the other day, and I smiled, and I thought, "Why am I smiling? They can't even see me." But <laughs> apparently, but apparently, I'm reliably informed by my wife that you smile with your eyes, so maybe they did see me. Maybe, but it, it is. It's utter, utterly surreal. I mean, I was going to ask you though, um, how on earth did you survive lockdown in a house full of women? <laughs> I don't know how I did. The, um, <laughs> I'm, I've got, I think I've, I've got like a little bit of OCD and I, I like a routine. I like to know what I'm doing. And I actually think it helped, uh, helped us all really. Cause I quite like to have like, a, we'd have breakfast then it'd be like school time. They do the school work and stuff and sort of plan a bit of a day. And I think, I think that helped a lot. Um, like I say, as a family, we really enjoyed having that time together, which I'm sure plenty did. But then like I said, towards the end, I think, even though my kids wouldn't admit it, they were ready to go back to to school or are ready to go back. And I was definitely ready to go back to football because I was sick of running. Like I just, I just felt like I just was running all the time. Um, yeah. But I, I mean, it helped massively in terms of like say my routine and my day to day stuff. But I was like so nice now to to just be back to relative normality. How was Mr. McEwen, oh, Mr. McEwen, I should say, the teacher? How, how did you find being a teacher? Because I had to teach my daughter, uh, and she obviously she has autism, as some of our listeners probably know. And it led me to respect teachers who do this full time even more than ever it, before. It, honestly, I couldn't I couldn't have enough respect. I mean, depending on how my career goes, like management or goalie coaching would be one option, but PE teaching something that I've looked at um, and after lockdown, I don't know if I'll look at it again. <laughs> it's a, like it really is like a it's a tough job, and I know maybe your kids have more respect for the teachers than they do for you. But I'm uh, eleven year old, uh, she turned twelve during it. But the homework that she was getting, it was like, can you help me with this? And it's like, um, no, I'm not sure I can help you to be honest. It was <laughs> it was tough. Uh, I'm mean, like I'm sure there's plenty of people out there with the same, but it just it almost took me back to being at school and how I felt at school, where I thought I really don't know anything. I better I make really sure want to do a okay professional football. footballer. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was how I felt. Um, but I did. I got I got a well done. Uh, thanks for being a good teacher card at the end of it all. So that that was something. Ah, boom, man! That makes it all worthwhile. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, excellent. Uh, let's move back to last season, though. Obviously, coming off um, what is a surreal time. It, it, it was a surreal time as well on the pitch for a while for Grimsby, wasn't it? You, you start in the new season, obviously uh, Michael Jolly as your manager, and uh, yeah, it, it didn't quite go as many expected. In fact, I think it's fair to say the Michael Jolly saga, the, the dismissal, was probably one of the biggest surprise managerial changes for man, many of us neutrals uh, watching on last season. 
did you guys get wind of it? Did you know that this was something that was coming? Because he seemed to be building something with the club. Um, no, I mean, I definitely, definitely didn't know it was happening. Uh, I don't think the players thought it was happening at all um, because the day he left, he actually had us in like, I'd gone in, he'd had me in first because I was obviously captain. He'd had me in first to tell me what had happened and then he had all the lads in, in into the meeting and like said his goodbyes and I think the lads were shocked because, I say shocked, you, you, I don't know if things do shock you as much in football. Like we'd, it was it was a strange year. Like we started, we started pretty well. Um, we're doing okay. We obviously went to Chelsea in the in the cup and got absolutely battered. And then on the Wednesday, we travelled to Exeter on the Friday and beat Exeter when they were unbeaten. Uh, really good performance. Changed changed pretty much the whole team. Um, and you're thinking, what? Like you know, we can really kick on here. And then we, I don't think, I think it was after that we just could not buy a win. Uh, for however long it was and, and so in that respect nothing surprises you and then I think the you know as a as a manager in his first couple of years in the game um, and he felt like like some really innovative ideas that he had I think he started to try and maybe do a lot of them all at once yeah so I think then as players, like, it was getting a bit, the lads were unsure what we were doing at times uh, in terms of, like, strategy, tactical stuff. But the one thing that I would say through all of it, to be fair to him, he, like, he maintained, like, himself, if that makes sense. You, know, you see managers, like, can start to lose a plot a little bit, for want of a better phrase. But, you know, he was quite strong in his beliefs. Uh, it, listen, I, I'd never want anyone to lose a job. Um and then there's a lot of good stuff that he'd done at the football club. Uh, but, you know, we spoke about it off air. I think there's got to come a point where when you come out of, of non-league, depending on what your budget is and depending on where you are as a football club at that time, you, you, you don't just want to keep surviving at the bottom of League 2 because eventually you, you go back down. It just happens. You know, you, you've got to be making the next step. Uh, and I think the club, the club obviously won... I thought that a change would, would help us do that. Uh, and again, like we changed to Anthony Limerick, obviously was caretaker for a while. And I, I think, you know, honestly, we improved and we improved a lot in our performances, but we were really, and I hate to be that, when you know, there were some games we were poor in, but we were really unlucky in some games. Uh, and I'm sure he probably looks back and, and thinks, God, if we'd have just got a goal here or a goal there. Uh, and we had this spell over Christmas, and you're thinking, God, we just can't get a win here. And then, yeah, you got plenty of draws, didn't you? I remember, but you, you just couldn't get the the three points that were so important. Yeah, exactly. And then, lo and behold, <laughs> the gaffer gets appointed. I think on was it the New Year's Day? I think, and we he, he wasn't actually in charge for that game, but we won it. And it's like it's amazing how it just works. Mm. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it was it was it was it was a it was a strange opening start to the season, but then obviously. An even stranger end to the season, really. Yeah, I mean, you guys were... So, you guys would have been playing, obviously, in training as normal, but seeing in the background uh, this growing this growing shadow that was COVID-19, it was spreading across Europe, it was spreading across Italy uh, in particular. And, you know, not to get political, but our government didn't feel like they were taking it very seriously at the time. There was implications from them that it wasn't going to affect us at all. And... You know, football continued, but then it did start to affect this country and people did start getting it and hospitals were starting to struggle. And it was almost, I think, inevitable in the mind of most of us that football couldn't continue, especially with crowds, if if what we we're seeing elsewhere was going to be replicated in England. And how did you guys as a football club and as professional footballers sort of see it and take it? It was strange. Like, like you say, I think... It, it was almost there, wasn't it, for a, at least a month, but maybe like bordering on a couple of months. And, you know, I'm probably guilty as anyone. Like, I remember saying to my wife, like, oh, this is strange. Like, it's so, so strange over, like, basically a, a bad flu. Like, it can't be that bad. Uh, and, like, I, I really enjoy, like, I enjoy watching horse racing uh, and watch Cheltenham. Uh, every year I think I wish I'd go, but didn't go but watch Cheltenham and I'm thinking 
this is bizarre because some parts of Europe and the world are shutting down. Cheltenham's going on, but Cheltenham went on, and I think I don't know if we played on that Saturday, um, or we were due to play. No, I think we were due to play on that Saturday. We played the Saturday before and beat Scunthorpe. Then Cheltenham went on, but there was like wind starting to come through that, like you know, our game might not be on Saturday, but we actually trained the Friday morning, yeah, doing set in the middle of set pieces. Then Gaffer, uh, I think Ben Davis, first team coach, come over and was like, "That's it, lads, it's off, game's off." get yourselves off home so we went home like we'll be in touch and then that was it and it was just it, it was bizarre but then we had that period where we might have been coming back yeah and we didn't know if we were going to be coming back so the lads were you know we were trained as best as we could at home and you're thinking i've got to do more here because i'll be back into we could be back on the monday and playing on the saturday so i've got to stay on top of my fitness so although we had this long period off in terms of football we've been Doing more, I've, done, so I've certainly done more than I've ever done in like an off season, because there was always that potential to come back. It was only I ended up being on the the League Two captains calls uh, with the EFL, and even them calls we did a few every Friday, and they were so mixed. It was like we're hoping to be back in May. If we're back in May, the Championship might be back, and it was it was all so mixed, and it was so I was trying to relay the messages to the lads, and I was like. I haven't read, I've got a lot of information for you, but it's not going to help you at all. Um, so that's like, although I think what you'll find, I know there's been a lot of talk about injuries when people are coming back and stuff. I think you'll find there'll be a lot more injuries towards the end of the season because I think it will have been, strangely, people's bodies, especially at the top level, they will have been on the go for a long, long time, a long time. Um, I mean, even now, like pre-season, I feel fitter now than I ever have done in a pre-season. But is that because I haven't really had the downtime? Obviously, no one's going to know really until it plays out. No, exactly, because a lot of people were, like say, just kept going, thinking that football was about to come back. And even some of the clubs in League 1 and 2 played the playoffs, so um, a lot later than the normal. So it, it's it's remarkably crazy. I mean, although... Not a bad win for Grimsby Town fans and your club to to end on away at Scunthorpe. No, I mean, it couldn't have ended any better in that respect. But like frustrating as well, I think. Like I think we'd had the we'd played uh, Northampton on the Saturday and Plymouth on, away on the Tuesday, and we lost three 0 in both. And I think that sort of kicked us a little bit in terms of. I think there was that half the gaffer coming in, we picked up quite a bit. And there was that little carrot that thinking, you know, a couple of wins in, we can get close. Um, now, whether that was the case or not, whether we were one of them typical, with the greatest respect to us, like, were we going to have one of them mid-table seasons where you're always close, but you're never quite close enough, which is what a lot of mid-table teams are. Um, I'm not sure. But them two results, like, knocked us back a bit. But then, obviously, went there on the Saturday and won. Like, he's playing away. I've played, played away there twice now for Grimsby, and it's unbelievable. Like, the fans... The fans are unbelievable. It's quite a tight ground. Like, just really enjoy it. And like, we've won there twice, so it obviously makes it a lot better. Um, so it was a it, it was a nice one to finish on as time went on. But at the time, it was like, oh, we would like to keep kept going really because we were actually like I say we we were doing okay. Yeah, you did. You certainly picked up. What was it like then? Because obviously, uh, Michael Jolly's gone. Anthony Limerick had taken over. There was always this this rumor, wasn't there? I don't know where it came from, but that. Uh, that Ian Holloway was going to come in and, and take over. And he's obviously, he did, and he, he had that long meeting with your chairman and he even has bought a stake in the club to, you know, to, to I suppose, want to see it progress. But, I mean, he is, as managers go, for his reputation, I mean, he's very good pickup for, for a League Two side, isn't he? Yeah. Well, the, listen, I, I think I was as shocked as everyone when I see the name linked. And a few people, like, I've got obviously friends around here, oh, is, 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 is he going to be your new manager? I'm like... I very much doubt it. <laughs> I can't see it. But obviously he was. And like, I think it, it's strange. Like the longer you're in the game, it's amazing how different each manager can be. You think to yourself, like we, we all love football. We all have our opinions on football, whether it's tactical or whatever it might be. But it's amazing how different different managers can be. And uh, as someone who I think, you know, I would I would like a crack at management one day. It's an unbelievable opportunity to learn and like see what he does, because he he's what you see on telly is what he's like, 
Yeah, he, like, I met him at the uh, Wickham Lincoln game. He was part of the Quest team, I think. And you know, I was just telling him about how basically his Bristol Rovers side destroyed my dad's ambition to ever take me to Oxford match again. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he just has this lovely, you know, the way of talking to people where he's engaging, he'll chat with you, he's always got time for you. And you don't, to be honest, a lot of football guys I've met, because I, I sort of know people in the low league circles, they're very nice. But, you know, you can imagine that there's the football being the industry it is, it's, they're not all like him. You know, he's a lovely bloke. No, and do you know what? <laughs> He's actually like a like like you just said he's a, he's a lovely person like I was surprised like we we played Colchester away and I don't think he'd, I don't think he'd mind me saying it like I I went in at half time uh, I think we we two one down maybe and I I I, I lost me a little bit like I thought we were all of us myself included were poor on the day or poor on the night uh, in the first half like felt even though they were in really good form at home I felt like we the opportunity was there for us um, and we were just poor. So I went and had a bit of a pop and we, we won this, we won anyway, we won 3-2. Uh, it was when Charles Vernon scored that wonder goal. And yeah, he just kept going, didn't he? Yeah, and that, that day, the gaffer had actually, I've never never experienced this before, we went, we travelled down early, went bowling and went out for lunch and then on to the hotel for pre-match. Um, so that, I mean, that's another story. So, but, on the Thursday, then when we came in, he said to me, "I, oh, you know, basically, it didn't he wanted me to encourage rather than have a go?" And I was, I was like a bit taken aback because I thought, you know, I mean, I, I, I try and say what I see. Like if I think I've been rubbish, if I've been good, or we've been good as a team, or rubbish, or you know, I try and balance it out. But he, he loves encouragement. Like he loves, he loves to encourage people. You know, if you miss something nine times out of ten. He just encourages you and encourages you. You've got no problem with you making mistakes. He doesn't stop a session and come on and like rip someone to pieces. I think I think people would be surprised. He's what you see, like like you say on the telly and stuff. Like he's, you know, he's he he's got so much enthusiasm, but he loves coaching. He really enjoys coaching, which I think would surprise people. We've got like uh, he's got a couple of sessions that like he loves to put on. He loves to do. And then he steps back and it's almost like he becomes a manager, like he's a coach and a manager. Um, it's quite interesting to watch, really. You know, sometimes you might not see him in a session at all. And then other times he'll take the whole session. So it's, yeah. it's, you, it's really strange. Like I say, I've worked under so many different types now. And it's obviously different, again, at our level, because we don't have an abundance of coaches. You can't just go over with the striker coach or the defensive coach or whatever they might have at other clubs. So, like, it's it's really interesting to see, like, Michael Jolly was very hands-off. Um, he loved to coach. Uh, Russell Slade didn't do hardly any coaching. Uh, so, it, it, it really varies. Yeah, I'm sure it does. And we don't yet know, really, what 2020, 2021 will hold for football, life in general. Um, but looking at Ian Holloway taking you into this new season, his, his first full campaign... What are your thoughts about it? What are your hopes for it? What are your realistic take on on what your side will be able to do? Oh, I hope that he's the one that can make a difference in terms of like us progressing. Like I like I said earlier, I don't want to be in a I don't want to be and I don't think anyone at the club obviously wants to be at, at that team that's fighting at the bottom of League Two or you know there comes a point mid table is not good enough. You know you want you want to be successful. You're in the game to be successful. You know what's Champions League final. And like you see what it means to players, and you know obviously, especially at the top level, it probably gets thrown at them a lot about the money they earn and etc. And you see what it means to people, winning and losing. You yeah. know, it's the same for us. You want we're in the job to be successful. You're not, you know, you don't grow up being a, wanting to be a footballer to think, oh, you know, I want to win one week and lose the next. I'm not really bothered. You know, it's the one thing that I always think that fans, the one thing that a fan should never throw at you is that you don't care. I've probably played maybe with one or two players that I've genuinely thought, don't think they actually care. I think they can get in the car and go home and literally not care. On the whole, regardless of people's body language or, you know, that that side of things, this is our job. Like, especially at our level, it's month to month. Like, we need to be paid. We need to be in a job. And it means so much to people. And people are better at handling it than others. But it means so much. And you you want to be successful. And so you hope, I hope, we hope that, that he's maybe the one that can help you take the next step. Um, 
at the moment, it's so difficult to say. Like, look at Mansfield. They seem to have gone out and signed loads of players um, and look like they've done some really good recruitment. But then I thought that last year with them, they, they struggled last year. Uh, Salford, again, I think with the, the budget, the way they run, no issue. I'll, I'll mention that maybe in a minute. But, like, I think they'll get it right sooner or later. So it'll be competitive. Bolton have come down. Uh, but you just, you never quite know. You never going like, to look at Cheltenham, Cheltenham in general. You wouldn't have put them up there maybe the last couple of years, but they've been steadily improving and steadily getting better. So you, you never know. Like, like I say, we finished last season in good form, and it's can we build on that? It's, it's just such a unique situation. You're not quite sure. The one thing I think everyone agrees on is we hope we don't get a second wave that puts a stop to the next season, because not only will it be so disappointing for everybody connected to football, but actually jobs, livelihoods and clubs for existences are very much on the line at the moment um, that's a huge concern I think for everyone I mean the, the news that Sky and the EFL have come to an agreement where games can be streamed um, even on Saturdays until the government allow 50% capacity crowds back in that's very welcome because I think it gives a revenue stream to clubs which could keep them alive but goodness me it's um, it's all still up in the air there's still quite a lot of people who think that the football season next year will either not have crowds as soon as we think, maybe no crowds at all, or indeed we'll we'll have to stop again. I just hope uh, I hope they're wrong. James, as per usual, though, uh, we've gone to our social media army and asked for some questions for you. So now I know you haven't seen all of these, so it'd be interesting to see uh, what you come up with. Well, I'm going to start with a question from our very own Ed Walker. And he says, have you ever celebrated a goal more than that Nathan Arnold one? He said, I'm sure he knows which one I'm talking about. <laughs> the one at Eastleigh away. Um, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think I have. Uh, I, the only one I actually think I might have done was the first year we lost in the playoffs when we lost to Bristol Rovers. Um, I had, a, I had a little sprint towards our fans. I don't, I don't know where I got a sprint from. Um, but I celebrated that. And then after, obviously, we ended up losing that game, I always had it in the back of my head. I thought, I've got to be careful here. Like, you know, maybe I don't want to over-celebrate and put the kiss of death on us. Um, but when Naif scored that goal, I knew it was over. And so I actually could, like, let go. Um, didn't I don't know why particularly I ran to the gaffer and the staff Uh but I just I think the lads were too far away, so I ran to the nearest thing. So, um, yeah. but no, that I def, definitely that was that was up there. Yeah, I can I can imagine. Um, Nathan, again, one of our own. He says, "How's Project San Marino going?" Uh, it's dead in the water. <laughs> I, um... I was going to say, have you you? So th- this was an intriguing story. I looked at this and I thought, James McEwen. Okay, I know. And I always call you England's number one, but I get criticised because you're, you, you're Irish, essentially, isn't it? Or you, you Irish yeah. in your family. But San Marino, and I was thinking, where's that link come from? It's basically a hill in Italy, isn't it? Yeah, like, I mean, I, strangely or not, I think I can qualify for either Republic or Northern, Spain, San Marino, Italy, and England. Um, just because of, yeah, because of grandparents, but then my dad was adopted, so it was, it was quite complicated, but uh, the San Marino one basically relied on me getting uh, some kind of birth certificate from my mother's dad, but he left when my mum was 12, so I think it's literally nearly impossible to find him. Um, I know his name, like his name was Racina Marieka, uh, which is probably slightly sexier than McEwen, um, <laughs> but other than that, and a new sort of rough time that he came to England and left England. It was just like impossible to find. Like, I had a few people try and look into it, but like I say, because he left when my mum was 12, my mum naturally just cut off contact, which is understandable. So I'm like, I've not been able to do it. I mean, the, the one thing strange that I, I, I would absolutely love to represent Ireland again. Like, I'd absolutely love to. I mean, it's ship's probably long sailed now, but it's the one thing that I would really like to do uh, and try and achieve. But it's very, it's very difficult. So the San Marino thing come up, and it's like, well, it's not. It could have been an opportunity to play international football, um, which would have been amazing, and get to go and play in some incredible stadiums. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going anywhere at the moment. I was going to say that you, you probably face enough shots as the Grimsby goalie rather than go to San Marino. <laughs> Talk about 
going from one deep end into the into the abyss. <laughs> I, could, I could be leaving with a bad back after San Marino, that's for certain. Yeah, I do though. I do remember the the shock goal they scored against England. I was watching that game, and I remember shouting to my dad hadn't even come to the sofa yet to to watch it with me, and I shouted to him for goal, and he's like, "Oh, we were quick off the mark." I said, uh, "No, San Marino have scored." Was that the Stuart Pearce back pass? That was it. Yes, yeah. that was the famous yeah. one. And my dad was like spitting tea all over the carpet. <laughs> Uh, Thomas Gray, uh, hey, a competition winner. He won, a, yeah, he won our competition to get the new Grimsby home shirt this season. So congratulations oh, nice. to him. Uh, he has asked the best player you've ever played with. Um, the best when I was at Warsaw, Paul Merson was player manager, um, and he he was he was on another level. Um, I would love to pick a defensive player like Steve Stoughton was there at the time actually, uh, and although he couldn't like run particularly, so to speak. Like you could see why he'd been at the top level, uh, and was like running. Violent. I thought running would be quite an important like physical trait for a footballer. Though. Yeah, you'd think so, but he he read the game so well, you could just see how much ability he had. But Merson was, he only had he literally only used his right foot. It was incredible. And I remember once he chipped me in training, and like getting chipped as a goalie for some reason is a thing. Like you you don't want to ever get chipped. Like you have a you have a chip on your shoulder about it, and. <laughs> He chipped me and he went, don't worry about it, son. I've done it to better keepers than you. <laughs> I was like, all right then. Thanks, Gaffer. Um, but, I mean, he, he was he was the best that I'd seen. Like, he could do things with the outside of his right foot that you, you like. You, he would see passes that you wouldn't dream of seeing. Like, it, it was unbelievable. And at that point, maybe he was, what, 36, 37. Like, he wasn't in his peak physical condition and he was still, he's still the best player. Yeah, I'm always, point. always with Paul Merson, you put that in inverted commas. Only peak physical condition. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And like, and, and also, like, I'm not sure management was for him, obviously, but a great guy, like a really, a really, a really good guy. Like the players loved him. I bet, I bet they did. I, yeah, what a player he was. Yeah, so that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, Rough Mariner has asked, has Macca been improving his culinary skills during lockdown? And are you yet up to the level where you add rosemary to your Sunday roast to infuse the flavour? Do you know what? Food food is like my best friend. Like I, I don't think I'd be my wife if she couldn't cook. Uh, I have actually, I've during lockdown, I've brought back out home uh, bread making with the kids. So ah. I can make a decent loaf. Um, I, I actually, I, I enjoy cooking. I enjoy eating. Like it's a big part of me as a family growing up and it's, like a big part for us as a family, we we always try and make sure we sit down and have a dinner together uh, most nights. So um, I have, yeah, I think if I had guests coming round, I'd make the homemade bread and get my wife to make uh, her homemade paella because she, she's very good at it, to be fair. But I, the bread's the bread's the key because when it goes on the table, that's like that's the the main bit isn't it everyone looks at that and it's like oh yeah homemade bread so yeah, I'm you, doing you the go, most homemade, I made that homemade yeah, that yeah exactly yeah. So. so did you make the butter yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and I made the packet it came in yeah that's it yeah there we go uh, Mark Hodgson has said what are your long term ambitions beyond football uh, or do you fancy the idea of coaching uh, I don't know if I mentioned this I don't know if this was on air or off air but I you know I said like newfound respect for teachers but I think for me, goalkeeper coaching would be an easy, again, inverted commas, easy route in terms of I'd know what I'm doing. Uh, you know, quite quite a comfortable existence, if you like. Uh, management is something that I think I would like a crack at. I'm not sure if I did it. I don't think you ever quite know. But it's something, you know, I, I feel like I've had a lot of experience of different managers, different situations now. So something that I definitely look at, uh, do my coaching badge, Badges for that, uh, and then PE teaching would be the other thing that I'd look at because I think I'd like to be active. You know, I look at my wife; she works like it's a computer-based job basically, and I don't think I could do that. I'd like to be active in my job, so PE teaching something that would keep me involved in sport and relatively healthy if I can do that when I finish playing, even even with my home bread making. Yeah, so no, I, I would say I, I'm a freelancer who sits at a computer far too long. It, it physical being physically active i i once was i had a job where i used to be very physically active and i do miss it you do you yeah really do. and that's everyone says that who are in them jobs and you know look at i was having to during lockdown i was trying to go for a run first thing in the morning 
before my wife started work. So I'd be going for a run at like 6.30. And in the end, like I was going, I'll just go after work, after you finish work. And, and that was tough. It's tough to find the motivation. I think like if I was doing that every day, I can't imagine getting up every morning and thinking, I'm going for a run. I'm going to like, it, it would be hard. So, um, yeah, they'd, they'd be my three choice at the minute. And it, I'm quite conscious of the fact that I want to wake up one summer and be like, oh, God, I've got to get a job here. So hopefully I'll be in a position regardless of a, a smooth-ish transition out of football. Yeah, I, I do echo the difficulty of motivating yourself for a run. I, it's always in January, isn't it? New Year's resolution. Oh, yeah, start running. I did a few, and I was doing them ridiculously early because I have to do it before my kids wake up, essentially. And I sprinted out of the house, yeah, nice and quiet. And I was only wearing a T-shirt and shorts. I was running. I was thinking, bloody hell, it's freezing out here. You know, all the enthusiasm. I forgot it was in minus eight degrees in January. I was like, oh, dearie me, what am I doing? And that is, I think, I'm pretty sure I've got, uh, is it Raynard's? Where you, basically my fingers, it, as, soon as, as soon as a cold hair or wind hits my fingers, they go white. They don't just go cold. They go white and I can't feel them. And exactly the same, even like if I went first thing in the morning at the moment, it would be, I'd be absolutely freezing. So I'm, I know that I get that now. So I'll go with my jumper on and I pull my sleeves down. And then halfway through my run, I'm absolutely sweating. So yeah, it, yeah. there's, there's no balance in there at all. That's it. I just, I might just run laps around my garden and then uh, <laughs> that'll do. That's enough. Uh, Dan Thompson has asked, which former Mariner player do you or did you least like uh, or did you least look forward to facing on an opposition team? Well, I'm, I know one person is going to be desperate for me to say him, so I'm not going to say Podge. Uh, I was going to say that. I thought I bet he's going to say Podge or Cameron. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, he's obviously he scored a couple against me now. So, um, But in terms of... It's a stranger on me, Podge, because I've said to everyone, like, you can, you can easily... You can think you've got him in your pocket for 89 minutes. But he always gets a chance, um, and he's a great finisher. You know, he's always the one. He's the one that you, he's got something you can't. I don't think you can teach it. To be fair, that natural instinct of the, he's very proactive. He always he's always alive and he's always in there. Um, so I mean, obviously, Podge would be the, the most natural one because he scored against me a couple of times. I'm not sure. To be the other one would probably I'd say Oli Palmer. Whenever we play against him. He's an absolute animal. And I don't know if, again, you know, playing your former team and it gives you that bit of a pick-me-up. Um, but he, he's done really well against us and he, he's a real handful. And, I mean, look at the size of him. He's got everything you'd want from that position. And I think he's, when I watch him now, I think he's learned that that's what he is, if that makes sense. I, I have this with a few players uh, where I think if you recognise what you are, um Early on in your career, I actually think you can have a much better career. So if your if your if your strength is if your big strong holding midfielder, don't try and hit forty yard diagonal passes. Just win the ball and give it to a good player, and you'll make a really good career out of the game. But it's obviously very difficult as a a young player to recognise that, and include myself in that. You know, as you get older, I think you start to recognise what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and you try and play to them. And and that that's important, I think, to try and do that. Yeah, absolutely. Good advice there for any young professionals listening. Uh, Glyn Charles has asked, which away ground do you look forward to playing at the most? Uh, this was one of one of the questions I actually seen. Um, so I take obviously I try and pick one out of our league, uh, and I don't know again if if this comes back to your performances at them grounds because I do enjoy playing at Exeter and I've done okay at Exeter in the past. Oh, okay, Mr. Modest here, everyone. Mr. Modest. You, <laughs> that has been described as, like, the best ever goalkeeping performance in the universe ever. It actually forced me to do some work on Photoshop, if I'm sure you remember, <laughs> which, uh, yeah. for a bit of a laugh, and, you know, you were Superman that day, no doubt about it. No, I, I do enjoy their stadium. I think I think the fans are really good. I think the atmosphere is good. The pitch is good. I do, I do, like, I do like that stadium. Um, I enjoy playing at... I, I enjoyed Bradford this year. Uh, that was really good. But again, it's obviously a nice stadium. But your, mem your memories can be distorted because I, th I actually think Tranmere is a nice stadium, but I hate playing there because it's just one of them grounds where you feel like you don't never particularly play that well. Um, yeah. But I'm looking forward to going to South End this year. I haven't been there since I was at Peterborough, so a long time. But I remember thinking that was a really good stadium. But like, like a, 
uh, I don't know, like just natural about it, like a, a, a tight kind of an old traditional ground, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think I prefer them. Like as in, I could do like Bradford, even though Bradford's big. Bradford's like a, an old traditional stadium. It's got big, high stands, and I do like that. So, but I, I mean, Exeter's probably my favourite uh, at the moment in our league. I would say. Yeah, and with good course, you 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 basically turn into an unbeatable goalie when you go. <laughs> Uh, Jack, uh, sorry, Jack Brighton. Yes, penultimate question: Which away day was better, Palace FA Cup or Chelsea Carabao Cup? Palace FA Cup. Uh, hated Chelsea. I hated every minute, uh, barring the warm up, because I got to warm up near Peter Check, and I felt like I'd made it. <laughs> um, he was out on the pitch for some reason. Enjoyed walking out. Uh, enjoyed going to like see my family in the stadium, in the, in the crowd, uh, trying to pick them out. After that, I hated and will always hate every minute of that game. And, uh, you know, people will say to you, yeah, but, you know, you've had the... It's a load of rubbish for me about the experience. We went and lost a game of football 7-0. And whether I did okay or, you know, whether my family were proud that they were there watching and my kids went, I lost a game of football 7-0. And I just don't think whoever you play, you should lose 7-0. Um, was it 7-0 or 7-1? Oh, 7-1, no watching. <laughs> I've blocked out our goal. That's how bad it was. Um, I just don't. I don't think you ever should lose seven one. It was just, it was horrible. Like the second half, like felt like they were just going to score every attack. Um, I just, I didn't enjoy it. And then like you know, come off and and everyone's different. Like and I totally, I totally get you know some lads want to swap shirts and and the rest of it. But I just, I just didn't enjoy it to be honest. Uh, Palace on the other hand, although it hurt, it hurts more in thinking that we were ten minutes away from achieving. Like genuinely something incredible, I thought, because to be have ten men for that long against a team that put out a top side, uh, we give it everything, and we only fell just short. And I was proud; I was proud to be part of the club. I was unbelievably proud to be captain that day. Our fans were amazing. Their fans were incredible. You know, I remember going there with Peterborough uh, a long, long time ago, thinking, "Wow!" Like, didn't think it was like this Selhurst Park. I didn't think they'd have that good of atmosphere. Uh, but are they the best fan? Uh, I mean, I think they're the best fans in London. I, I've, you know, London fans tend to be, I think, in the Premier League, you know, pretty demanding and and pretty quick to turn on their team if they're not doing very well. I think Crystal Palace, they they pretty much have been down right in the dumps for, for. I mean, I remember them struggling to survive years ago, and they've been in League One. So I mean, yeah, their fans are just loving the fact that they're this st- stable Premier League side. I think right now. That's I mean the greatest respect, like a, a League Two side had taken them to near enough with 10 men taking them to a replay and the fans didn't get on the back once they were just singing they were like it like I say it was unbelievable they clapped us off at the end uh yeah absolutely 100 percent. the Pal- the palace game will like live long in my memory the chelsea i never want to see it again <laughs> yeah i remember as a kid uh oxford it would have been the 98 99 season when we went down from the championship we one weekend we lost i think it was seven nil away at sunderland and my mate rang me up straight afterwards and just laughed down the phone. And then the weekend after, we were at home to Birmingham and we went and lost 7-1. And yeah, so I just thought, it was, well, at least we improved slightly. <laughs> <laughs> you're, trying to look, you're trying to look for positives, aren't you? And it's like, like I say, like my family, I speak to my family and we're like, yeah, but you know, you got to play there. We're so proud. You had a typical mum and dad, wife stuff like kids are like, oh yeah, like great stadium. Although they couldn't really care less. Um <laughs> But yeah, like just for me, just like like I said to you earlier, want to be successful. Losing seven nil isn't successful because regardless of what people say, when you get a big team in any competition, you've got that hope and that carrot of achieving achieving something, of being the ones on the back of the paper the next day who've achieved that incredible upset. So you go there, even though you know, of course, realistically, they're going to beat you nine times out of ten at least. Uh, just yeah, yeah, just wasn't what I wanted it to be. I can imagine, yeah. A uh, final question from Ben Bell. He said, how much of a difficult choice was it for players to take a pay cut? Now, I'm assuming this is all cause of the, the COVID crisis where we did see uh, some unfortunate you know, decisions made by some of the Premier League clubs. I remember, was it Tottenham and was it Newcastle trying to put their players on furlough uh, or play, yeah. non-playing stuff on furlough? I mean, you know, I, I just didn't like that at all. But for guys at your level, that, it, how hard was it? Because it's, you're not, you know, no disrespect at all to players in League Two, but 
as the spectrum of football finance goes, it's a tough league. Listen, I, two sides to this. One, absolutely, as players, we did the right thing because we were sat at home, uh, outgoings had gone down, and we were trying to do the right thing by the football club. Um, so, personally, and I think I'm speaking on behalf of all the players, we did the right thing without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, don't think in that respect it was difficult. Um, I think the the bit that I said to you earlier where we are month to month and whatever people think, that's we are month to month. Of course, like in general, you earn decent money, but you earn decent money for a short period and then you start your next career at the bottom of the ladder. Um, so it's, it's a difficult thing to weigh up because I've got two years left. Near enough, every other player at the football club has got one year left. You know, so you're asking players who have got one year's job money left to take a pay cut for a club. And this not just our club, but any club could particularly just turn around and say, well, thanks for everything. Uh, thanks for that pay cut you took last year, but we're going to let you go now. You know, that that really is like, it's a big ass for them players to do that. Yeah. Um, but the lads did it, like like I say, no, no issues whatsoever. The lads just got on and did it. I couldn't be prouder again to be captain of that group of players who were happy to do that um, for the benefit of the football club because there's a lot of fantastic, but especially at a club like ours, a lot of fantastic people behind the scenes who do so much work. Yeah, you do so so much good work, and and like you wouldn't want they're they're in general the ones who are going to be f- at first anyway at risk of losing their jobs. Um, yeah, I mean we saw it at Barnet, didn't we? Loads of staff lost their jobs and. Uh, you know, quite a few other clubs, I would imagine, will have to go the same way. Um, I remember before Wickham won promotion, less said about that, the better. But uh, they they had a chairman statement, which was basically saying he's advising all his non-playing staff to, to apply for or look for new jobs. I mean, that's how precarious the situation was. Exactly. And like, it's you, you don't want to see good people out of work. Um, so... I, it's it, it was the right thing to do uh, and like I mean the situation still even now like I'm not sure the situation you don't know when it's going to change because uh, it's moving so quickly uh, but like I said I couldn't, I couldn't have been proud of the lads and I think I think it was an easy decision to make uh, but the, the hardest bit is, is actually quite complicated to do that because you've got we had lads in Sweden lads in France we had lads who were getting released but didn't know they were getting released, uh, who you're then asking, you've got a month's left on your deal, will you take a pay cut, which I don't think was right, and the club agreed. So they didn't actually take on the players that were getting released, and rightfully so, because they were going to be out of a job for who knows how long. Yeah. So trying to sort through that and trying to find a compromise, uh, it was tough. It was really tough, and spent a long time on the phone, making calls, sending emails, because... Uh, Obviously, sort of being the face of it, really, which is, you know, it's been tough uh, that respect, but it needed to be done. Like I said, I think without a shadow of a doubt, it did the right thing. Absolutely, uh, James, you are you're now an honorary co-host of this podcast, seeing as you've been on here so many <laughs> times. It's a real pleasure to have you back on and for you to give me your time yet again. Really appreciate it. No, thank you for having me. It's um, it's always a pleasure, always. Your hat trick mug, which you, you know, I did say I'd give you, I think, a year ago. It's in the post now, actually in the post. Yeah, and, and biscuits as well, I'm told. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Chocolate hobnobs, everyone. Um, I, I'm not sponsored by chocolate hobnobs, by the way. McVitie's don't have any deal with this podcast, but they're the god of biscuits, let's be honest, you know. Yeah, no, I'm sure there'll be some kind of tweet from me with my cup. Uh, I'm not going to say eating the hobnobs, but the hobnobs close to hand. I think you'll find them hobnobs will get there before the cup, so they might there might be some jeopardy in that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you ever so much for having me. No problem at all. And, and if people are waiting for our uh, one to twenty four prediction pods, there will be an announcement this week about them. Um, I know I've had a lot of DMs for people wanting them out. We just didn't feel doing them in August would would be probably that credible, given there's so much that could still happen. But they will be out very shortly after so uh, yes we'll uh, we'll announce those in due course i hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast uh patrons big thank you to you guys who, who support us and if anyone can or is willing to do so and enjoys our content then you can do for so for as little as 80p a month um it's on our twitter profile you can go to the link and see what you can get for being a patron at d3d4 but until 
uh, yeah, uh, a couple of weeks maybe, a week's time. Uh, we will uh, we will see you then. Goodbye, everyone.